Okay. Uh, I would first like to thank uh, Dr. Sarin and his team for so successfully organizing this CME update for last so many years. And I, I definitely believe that this has been of tremendous help to all the postgraduate students who come here for a dose of a you know, comprehensive pediatric surgery coverage of all topics. So starting with our session, uh, I think in this session we have three presentations which will uh, focusing on the minimal access surgery and we will be covering from the basic to advanced to robotic uh, with the subsequent spe speakers. So I've been given the responsibility of uh, talking on the minimal access surgery for the beginners, the basic principles. And we will be covering very, touching upon very basic aspects of uh, uh, minimal access surgery. And uh, the purpose of this talk would be, uh, would be like if you are, if you are given a, uh, to write a short note or a, you get a question in your exam about, you know, writing on the basic aspects, you, will, you should be able to do so. The other purpose would be that if next week you are uh, asked by your seniors to go, go ahead and do a laparoscopic appendicectomy or a cholecystectomy, you would be a little more confident with all the basic con concepts that will be, which we'll be talking about. So minimal access surgery, we, we all know, is, is quite uh, coming up and a lot of procedures are now become standard in pediatric surgery and uh, it is in vogue. And it has been there for more than two decades now and, ex and has really expanded exponentially, uh, exponentially more than in any other specialties. So here, when we use the word beginner, it, it actually means, uh, has, has two meanings. A beginner is a person like a postgraduate student who is just beginning to learn uh, laparoscopic surgery. He is still learning pediatric surgery and is still gaining experience in the field of pediatric <coughs> surgery. There could be another scenario where there is a mid-career pediatric surgeon or a senior pediatric surgeon who was not previously doing laparoscopic surgery and now he is venturing into this area of uh, pediatric. So he's already experienced in, in pediatric surgical procedures, the open procedures, but now he's, he's trying his hand in the area of minimal access surgery. So in both, both the cases, the scenario is a little different and the perspective of both the kind of students is actually different. So we'll see how this can, we can try and achieve and make these people learn all the basic aspects. So before you venture into, that, in the, into this area, you have to clear your misconceptions. Misconceptions means that you should clearly know that this is the procedure. Yes, other people have done this procedure laparoscopically, and it is quite feasible uh, to do this procedure as a laparoscopic procedure. You should be clear about the anatomy, and as I said, all the experience in pediatric surgery knowledge has to be there. The applied anatomy, the setup and ergonomics, and knowing your hardware is actually of prime importance, and without that, you cannot actually go and operate on a patient with laparoscopic procedures. You, have, you need to know all about the port placements, all the light, optics, lens systems, and whatever uh, the gadgets which are there in your lab trolley. So all the tools of trade which you have in front of you, you should be able to make the best use of out of it, which can help you to do the procedure more efficiently and in a much faster way. The other thing aspect is that you have to be a part of, of that team where everybody has got a definite role play and everybody is complementing each other and you are able to accomplish with a, in, in a holistic manner with, with the rest of your team members. So a lot of us who have actually been trained in adult laparoscopic surgeries, we have you know, uh, assisted in lab coles, appendix and other colectomies and other procedures in adult patients. Here, the scenario in pediatric age group is again very, very different. So we, we use this sentence that our children is, is not small adults, holds equally true for all the patients uh, uh, whoever are going, uh, undergoing the laparoscopic procedures. So it has got its own set of principles and concepts which are quite different from what one would have been exposed during the adult training. So you have to learn, you have to unlearn a lot of things and then relearn to do the things correctly in a pediatric age group patients. So uh, with, with a very brief note on the history of pediatric minimal access surgery is, is that the first case was reported by Stephen Gans who actually did a peritoneoscopy by inserting a scope through a hernia sac and then he, di he diagnosed that there was a hernia on the opposite side. So this was this was a very uh, simple procedure which he did. He then subsequently re removed a broken shunt, uh, shunt piece from the abdomen via the laparoscope. So initially, people termed uh, it as a celioscopy, then the term peritoneoscopy came, and then finally the word laparoscopy came into use. So the, coming to the anatomical and the physiological issues which are very relevant, and the practicing surgeon who is attempting this procedure should be fully aware that what are the specific apps, aspects which are different from the adult patients. So you need to know that these patients are very small, you have uh, weight issues with these children, their abdomen, the surface area which is available in their abdomen is very, very small. The relative size of the organs inside the abdomen is very big. So you have a much larger size in proportion of liver and spleen in proportion to the total abdominal volume. 
we all know that most of the midline umbilical ligament, the falciform, the uricle ligaments, they are very prominent and a lot of times they are patent. And if you are placing a port or doing some procedure in that particular area, you will find difficulty. So that you have to keep in mind. The weight is a big limitation. The surface area to weight ratio is unfavorable from laparoscopy point of view because these patients are quite small. Our patients are quite small. Anesthesia, the problems are because of pneumoperitoneum. A lot of times you are operating on a sick patient who is a sick appendicitis patient and then he can have additional problems with the hypercarbia and the pneumoperitoneum. There is always an increase in the systemic and pulmonary vascular resistance with high intra-abdominal pressure and there is a lot of vagal response which will, which will result into adverse uh, you know, anesthesia events. There is always because of the distension inside the abdomen, uh, there is a reduced diaphragmatic movement and there is a cephalate migration of that abdomen because of the balloon effect and then it uh, reduces the lung ventilation. You always keep your patients in, in particular position where you are trying uh, to have gravity as your assistant. So either at, at times the patient may be around 30 to 40 degrees head up positions or maybe a head low position or uh, you know you are trying to bring the area of interest uh, to the top and then in, in the process you are actually manipulating the patient in an extreme position. So this again uh, is, is not a very, uh, you know, th this does not make the anesthetist very happy because they are always, uh, you know, uh, worried about what, uh, what things are pressing and what is happening over there. Most of the time we discourage our anesthetist to use, uh, not to use nitrous because it invariably results in distension of the bowel and it will make your procedure difficult. So once you are familiar with the basic aspects of your patient and you are getting the things in perspective now you have to set up before you start your procedure you have to set up the hardware around you in order to have the best possible mechanical advantage so the principle here is that the surgeon is facing the organ without twisting his spine you must have seen a lot of uh, surgeons operating around you who would actually be doing procedures while twisting their back so if you don't follow the basic line of the surgeon camera and organ and the picture if these things are not, uh, not in a straight line, it will have a lot of you know, physical discomfort to the person who is operating, as well as he will have an increase in parallax. So whatever the hand-eye coordination which you are trying to achieve while doing your procedure, you will always have uh, difficulty in that if you are not standing in a particular straight line, which is depicted in this figure. So we, we remember this uh, part, uh, the scope, the surgeon, camera, organ and the picture need to be in, the, in a straight line. So, with this concept, you set up your entire OT setup. So there are so many things which need to be placed uh, appropriately around the patient. So there is an anesthesia machine, there is a patient, your patient, the anesthesia machine, there is the lab tower which is there, and uh, your scrub nurse has to stand somewhere, she has got a trolley along with it, and there is a, there are a surgeon and his assistant surgeon, and maybe a second assistant sometimes. So here you can see if, if the surgeon, if you are doing an upper abdominal procedure, say a lab coli or a colidocal cyst, here you can see that you are, you are trying to achieve the surgeon, the uh, surgeon camera organ picture straight line and you are trying to stand on the side of the table. So here it may be a little difficult. It, it will be advantageous if you move this patient down to the edge of the table and then you try to rearrange all, all your things and try to array, uh, or get that straight line again. So with the patient coming down towards the edge of the table always gives you the advantage of moving around the patient in an arc and you will be standing quite comfortably and trying to uh, do your procedure. So that basic concept has to be kept in mind. This, this can change with whatever quadrant uh, you are uh, doing your procedure on, but it gives you the basic idea that how you can stand comfortably, specifically when, when you're doing very long duration surgeries, you will be able to do it with efficiency. So ergonomics is an important part. So once you have set up your uh, things around you, the position principles in regard to the patient, to the instruments and the surgeons, surgeon himself. So uh, the best way, the best analogy uh, with this is the pianist position, which imitate, imitate the pianist. So it's like a person who is playing the piano, where his shoulders are relaxed, he is sitting in a comfortable position, his keys, keys are at the elbow level, and then he is playing it. So here he's, he's not shrugging his shoulders, there is no excessive uh, you know tension in any any of his muscles and he is able to able to do what, whatever he wants to do uh, uh, at his comfort so the same thing has to be imitated by the surgeon so the table has to be elbow at the elbow level head and monitor at the same level so you're not flexing hyper flexing or extending your neck in order to see what you're doing on the screen and the grip especially is important because here you can see this is the one which we don't want to do so here the surgeon is flexing he's bending his back 
he is having a kind of a death grip uh, in, in, in to his instruments and then with this you can operate for 30 minutes but not more than that ultimately you will get tired you will start doing wrong things in your procedure and the outcome will be bad for your patients so you'll always have to take care of your standing position and uh, if you have to do big procedures long procedures you have to take care of this basic fact that uh, after you set up your ergonomics nicely you have to stand and, and have a proper fingertip grip uh, with your instruments coming to the port before you plan, uh, you know start your procedure you have to appropriately plan your port so the basic principle in planning your port is you have to maximize the degree of freedom degree of freedom means that you are able to move your the tip of your instruments in all directions which without too much of restriction restrictions caused either by clashing of instruments outside or clashing of the tip of the instrument with the viscera inside so that you have to maximize and there you can follow the principle of the port kite where you triangulate and try to achieve achieve a sort of a 90 degree angle between your two working hands with the tip uh, with the tip of the triangle at the organ of interest so with this we see that if you are operating on a kidney say you are doing a pyeloplasty or a nephrectomy you will follow the sa same principles where uh, you want to triangulate you can see that if we draw the line it will become uh, like this triangular port kite thing and the same thing applies if you do it uh, for the appendix or if you are doing a pelvic procedure most of the time the people who are doing appendix since it is a short procedure and if you are if you are doing an uncomplicated appendicitis you, they prefer to put the uh, uh, the port sites below the level of the umbilicus so they they may bring it down but still it it works i will briefly touch so these were relevant for the uh, abdominal part uh, i believe our subsequent speakers are going to speak on the thoracoscopy and uh, so mostly you would do it for mediastinum the basic basic idea is to divide the chest into four zones and then uh, you uh, based on the uh, zone of uh, interest where you are operating you will place your ports so if it is the diaphragm which you want to operate you will you will this is the blue circle is the area of interest and then you triangulate with that same port kite principles into the area so if you are if you are operating in the on the esophagus so this is this is the right the left side up but if you are operating on the esophagus uh, uh, then then the uh, port kite width would move accordingly <laughs> similarly for any mediastinal procedures you you would you again rotate your uh, port positions according to that the basic principle here is that you place the first port by the open method then all the subsequent uh, working ports are placed by the uh, uh, needle finder method where you prick in in the intercostal space with the needle and try to see from inside that your port is coming in so this we have spoken of now the first port in the abdomen which you do is usually transumbilical placed by the uh, open method and i usually advise to place the vicral closure suture right at the beginning because at the end you know you might be in a hurry or you may have to leave the uh, closure to a, a junior person and then uh, if if the stitches and the other thing is that at the end of the procedure the anesthetists are actually in a hurry to extubate and reverse the patient and the patient uh, the muscle tone increases and it is it become di becomes difficult to place your closure shoe sutures uh, while closing the umbilicus so place it right at the start so that at the end you may just have to uh, tie a knot to finish it off the other principle important principle is that the port should have a direct entry into the abdomen rather than going into an oblique manner creating a tunnel sort of thing uh, this will this will result in a in in two things first it will have a very uh, it will restrict the free movement of your instrument if it does not rotates like a, a pivot so so that that is the important thing so most of the time the most common mistake which the beginner will do is that he will first go through the skin and then he travels a uh, particular distance in the, into the muscle substance and then he comes out from the peritoneum uh, into the abdomen at a little distance creating an oblique tunnel and then uh, causing all the problems in smaller children whenever you are planning to whenever you are putting your port you know uh, uh, there is a f uh, always a danger of uh, you know injuring the surrounding viscera or you know hitting a blood vessel so <clears throat> this is one of the methods where you have the optical port in place and the other port which which you are placing this you can do in smaller children not in the bigger one where the port distance is not too much you put the port into each other and then push your uh, trocar through it so that there is no theoretical uh, you know possibility of injuring any viscera inside so this video just shows that you need to very uh, you know know each and every part of the port which you are using so you need to know that there are various types of uh, ports which are now available in the market the ball valve flap valve rubber flap and then there are valveless ones 
so the ball ball valve usually comes from uh, is made by the wolf people where there is a ball magnetic ball thing which which goes out of the way once you push the trocar or the instrument through it and the other pa- other thing is the flap valve where instead of a ball there is a flap now the problem with the ball valve and the flap valve is that they require some amount of resistance to push through it and if you are trying to pass a needle through it or trying to retrieve a needle uh, out from the abdomen it always you know there is a possibility that it gets stuck and and if the thread is weak at the joint of the needle uh, it may fall into that then the uh, disposable ports are there so these are the rubber flap valves so uh, uh, these are very uh, these offer the minimal resistance to the instrument movement through it and uh, taking in and out of passage of needle is is very easy you will always have to secure your ports to the abdominal wall so that it does not happen that while you are doing a procedure your port gets dislodged so now there are newer ports which are available which have got a uh, balloon uh, at the tip which inflates like a foley's uh, balloon and then it stays there uh, uh, in a, in a self retaining manner and the, it, the, it does not comes out of, on its own the only disadvantage is that these the diameter of these ports is slightly larger so any uh, a 5 french 5 uh, f- uh, uh, mm port would be almost like a 6 mm the lens the or uh, telescope which you are using uh, the goes uh, the light goes through is through through the op, uh, hopkins rod lens system and the lens the telescopes which are available to you are either 0 degree 30 degree 45 degree uh, you can choose most of the time in pediatric surgery practice you use the 30 degree telescope which because it gives you a better vision and you know uh, it gives you a good working distance so uh, the the advantage which you get with the 30 degree scope is that you are able to see past the obstacles in your field of view so just to uh, cite an example in in this scenario is that this is a case of an undescended testis the uh, sma- uh, site marked as o is actually the place where the testis is actually lying so with a 30 degree scope what you can do is that you can go in tilt the cable of the camera and go inside the canal and you will be able to see the testis inside so it's like if there is something if there is a pillar in front of me and i am picking it from the side so that is what a 30 degree and a 70 degree scope will be able to uh, allow allow you to do this and in this manner you can see past a, you know maybe a loop of bowl which is coming in front of you or something else which whichever is coming in front of you this is not possible by by a 0 degree scope so there are certain tricks where you can always uh, you know try to uh, 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 get past your difficulties the first and most foremost is use using gravity as your assistant so if you are doing an upper abdominal surgery and you do a head up position the loaded colon uh, and the rest of the bowel are going to fall by itself so uh, the other important thing is that uh, a very common mistake is that this assistant who is holding the camera is actually holding it like this and not like this so he is standing at a perpendicular uh, angle with the with the entire line of the surgeon camera organ and picture and which increases his paradoxical movement so you have to uh, take care of that you can always uh, uh, you know add the helping ports parietal wall hitches so whatever organ even for if you are doing appendix and you are finding it difficult you can just take a bite through the wall of the appendix and hang it with the uh, parietes and so that both your hands are free to dissect the base of the appendix rather than one hand holding it up and the other hand you are doing the dissection with a single instrument so and the other important thing is that tip of both your instruments should be in your view to have the best degree of hand eye coordination if, if even one instrument is out of your view the hand eye coordination is going to go down suturing there are multiple options of suturing for beginners which are available extra corporeal suturing there is a knot pusher and uh, i have made a few videos on how to uh, make a knot pusher uh, knot while doing an appendix there are sutures uh, catgut loops which come with preformed knots you can actually make them yourself also and then uh, if you are confident enough you can do the intracorporeal suturing where you usually follow the principle of the c and the reverse c so you just pick up your thread make a c loop of it and rotate the uh, uh, tip uh, keep the tip stationary and rotate the other end of the thread on the tip of that instrument and you'll be able to do it so this is more practical than you know showing it on a powerpoint presentation but it uh, it needs definitely it needs practice where uh, before you get you know competent and uh, confident for your pr- complex procedures as a part of tools of trade the, you need to know what energy sources which uh, uh, are available and how you will be able to you have to plan ahead that if there is an appendix how do i tie my mesentery whether i'll i am going to uh, you know use a monopolar cautery whether i am going to use a harmonic or or any other device 
so that it is there in front of you, you and you know how to use it. Because at the end, when the surgeon is standing, there is so much of stuff around us. There are so many, so many paddles on on his foot. He has to arrange it. Because if you if you push the wrong button at a wrong time at a wrong, where the tip of the instrument is touching something else, it can be a disaster. So you need to aware that what are the um, energy sources that are available. The common ones are the monopolar hook, ultrasonic, the bipolar, and uh, the NCL device, which is available. So the procedures uh, which have now become standard in pediatric laparoscopy. So there is no doubt every parent will come and say that I want uh, appendix. If it is appendix, I want lap appendicectomy or gallbladder, non-palpable UDT. We all know that it is a standard fundoplication, nephrectomy, pyeloplasty. Now, now there are so many large series of pyeloplasty and uh, uh, these are all uh, standard procedures now. The natural evolution in, in for a beginner is it starts with an ectomy, otomy and reconstruction. So you start with a cholecystectomy, you start with an appendicectomy or a, or, or a nephrectomy and then you later on go to a, you know, more complex procedures. I would add pyloromyotomy as a, as, a, as a level two procedure rather than doing it at, at the beginning because it, it uh, involves a small child. The port placement is very delicate and, you know, doing the myotomy is, is also very delicate. And then you go on to the uh, cons uh, complex procedures, the, the reconstructions, if you are doing bladder augmentation, cholecystic cyst, esophageal atresia, fundo, uh, ecclesia cardia, fundoplication and things like that. So there are, um, so we all know appendix and cholecystectomy are the learning procedures, but there are several other procedures which are actually easy to do, can be done by a beginner and are very short procedure and definitely helps you to gain confidence in basic laparoscopic procedures. Thoracoscopic lung biopsy is actually one of them where you will get a hand in going into the chest of the uh, uh, a pediatric patient and the procedure is very short. You just have to grab the, the end of a, of a lung piece, uh, make a cat uh, throw a catgut loop inside, tie it, maybe a double catgut loop, uh, be sure enough that there, is, there would be no leak or slippage of the tissue or slippage of the suture and then you come out. It's, it's hardly a 15 minutes procedure, but uh, it, it, this can be added as a uh, in a initial learning tool for all these patients. We have been doing a lot of other, uh, you know, uh, procedures like small, small abdominal cyst. We even did uh, laparoscopic cystolithotomy where there were large bladder stones and we were not able to handle it by the open method. We, so uh, we just went in just like we, we were doing uh, non-palpable undescended testes, make a small incision in the bladder, retrieve the stone, close the suture. So the resident would have a practice of suturing also handling the organ, retrieving of a, of a uh, you know, specimen and doing all those things. So uh, all these procedures are the procedures which you can look beyond the basic procedures which you know and are being taught in, the, uh, in your department. So the entire learning of uh, laparoscopy is actually a step ladder uh, you know, analogy where you start with the basics, as I said, the ectomy, otomy and the reconstruction procedure. And then uh, with your increasing confidence, you can, you can build up on your uh, skills. Your, there would be a build up of your team and there would be a better coordination. And with that, you can go on to do the, you know, the, you know, the complex reconstruction procedures and uh, enhance your skills. Complications, we all know there can be several. Uh, there are the, these can be de discussed in detail as a separate topic actually. So there can be trocar injuries, as I said, you can injure a viscera or a blood vessel energy source related injuries, port side problems are there, there can be hernia, so if you are not able to close the ports uh, nicely, you will have hernia problems, infection, hemorrhage, which are, which are a part of as a standard complication for any procedures. So again, I'll show this snake ladder uh, slide again, which was showed in the previous presentation, that for a laparoscopic surgeon at one day, he may be able to do a procedure very smoothly, everything goes very well, and uh, it may be a big procedure, but on an another day, he comes back and does a simple procedure as an appendix or a gallbladder, it can be very difficult and then he thinks, okay, the confidence has gone down. So, so it's a very zigzag and a you know, snake ladder game and you have to keep up your confidence, keep up building up your skills and you know, learn the skills uh, as per your thinking. <coughs>